22nd. And I think I said this at the beginning of the month, but September is Realtor Safety Month. And so this Friday and next Friday, we're going to focus on realtor safety. And I have a really awesome guest for you today. Uh, we in Iowa know Jen because she's been president of DMR. I believe you've also done some things with IAR, but if you attended um, any of the NAR um conventions. I believe Jen also spoke there on realtor safety because uh, she's going to share a story with you and we're going to learn why it is. Uh, sorry about that. I needed to turn that off. Um, she's going to she's going to share with you why realtor safety is near and dear to our heart. Um, it should be near and dear to all of our hearts because it's it's our lives. And we are in a business where um, we can get ourselves into some situations where we're alone. Um, but I think today we're going to learn some really good stuff. So Jen, go ahead and unmute yourself and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to try and share my screen here. This is the technical challenge <laughs> part of. Okay. Can you guys all see that? We've got it. Awesome. Looks awesome. great. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. And um, I'm going to go fairly quickly through stuff. If you have any questions, feel free to um, put them in the chat. I'll try and watch that or catch that at the end. Again, sometimes I'm not great with watching all of this technology. But as Sarah mentioned, I am a real estate agent in the Des Moines, Iowa market. I have been selling since 2006. This kind of goes back, I think this is one of my first headshots. So this tells you, uh, back when I started, I had done mortgages, I had had my first child and was looking for something a little bit different. I wanted some flexible work hours. As I was thinking of what could be my next career, I thought, well, I like to look at beautiful houses. Again, I was looking for some flexible work hours and who doesn't want to make a ton of money. So I got my real estate license and soon realized I did have flexible work hours. I could choose whatever 80 hours a week I wanted to work. It was flexible with my kids. I learned that they quickly became familiar with the real estate industry as they were oftentimes along with me as I was working. Many of the homes that I, I tended to see and look like looked more like the picture at the top of my of your screens than the mansions that I was picturing. And I still feel like every April that pile of money seems more representative of what I pay in for taxes than what I get to keep at the end of the year. But after about 17 years of selling, I do still love real estate and am glad that I chose this career. I want to share, I'm going to talk with you this morning. I know we only have a few minutes. Um, I want to share the story of two different ladies. Um, the first one that I'm going to tell you about was my friend, Ashley Oakland. I met Ashley um, through a mutual friend. It was a business partner of my husband and I. And Ashley, the first time I met her was at a company Christmas party, which uh, sadly I was not super excited to attend. But when Ashley came into the room, the whole energy changed. And it was that way um, going forward. Ashley had the ability to light up a room. If you were lucky enough to be her friend, she had the ability to make you feel like you were her only friend. If you would tell Ashley something or share something with her, she would remember it. Um, Ashley, my father had passed away years before I met Ashley, but um, somehow that came up in some of our conversations. And I remember on Father's Day receiving a note from her, uh, a text message, just thinking about you. That was one little example of the things, um, the type of person Ashley was. This time of year always gets me a little bit because Ashley was so good with kids. She loved kids, even though she was young and, and didn't have any yet. Um, it was about this time of year where you would come home and find a little pumpkin on your front step if you had kids and you were Ashley's friend that she would drop off for your kids. Every Halloween, I had my son, um, she would call and make sure that we were stopping by so that she could see uh, Jace in his Halloween costume before we went out. Uh, that bottom picture is when she met my daughter after I'd had her. She brought over dinner and gifts. Um, 
Again, Ashley was also a real estate agent, so we also had that in common. She was, at the time, hosting, um, she had a new construction townhome project that she had with a partner, and so they had open house hours six days a week. Her townhome project was actually closer to my real estate office than it was to Ashley's real estate office at the time. So often Ashley would stop by our office. Um, if I was there, we'd catch up for a few minutes. If not, um, she would often grab one of my business cards from my office, flip it over and leave me a note. This is actually a note that um, I found one day when when I came in. I would also stop by her townhome project during her open houses. I told her it was for the candy, but it was just to catch up with her a little bit. This is a quote that I came across um, years ago and it really uh, it really hit home with me. There are moments that mark your life, moments when you realize nothing will ever be the same. And time is divided in two parts, before this and after this. We all have those, of course. Maybe it was the day you had your child. I know for me, if I'm trying to think of when something happened, it was either was my son born or was it before he was born. Um, you may it may be when you met your spouse, when you got your real estate license. Um, you know when things changed and you remember before and after. One of those days for me was April eighth, two thousand eleven. It was a Friday. It started out just like any other Friday. Um, I had a busy day. I had a friend that had gotten married that morning or that afternoon, and I had gone and taken some pictures for her. Uh, in the afternoon before the reception, I had three houses that I was showing to a set of clients that I'd been working with for a while. Um, my client's name was Garnet, and we were going to look at three houses. I do believe that these were house numbers 788, 89, and 80 of the houses that I had shown Garnet. But we went out and we looked. The first one was pretty uneventful. I remember when we got out of the car at the second house, uh, Garnet's daughter was with us, and she mentioned that she'd heard on the radio on the way over that there had been a shooting over by Jordan Creek Mall. And if you're familiar with uh, Des Moines area and West Des Moines, that's an area that um, there's not a lot of crime. We don't have a lot of things happen like that. And I remember when she mentioned that, I quickly said, wow, that's a weird area. And I, I was on to the next thought. I immediately started opening the lockbox and going through the house um, and didn't give it another thought. When we arrived at the third house, which you see on the screen here, um, we went in. I started demonstrating the house to um, Garnet. I will give you a spoiler alert that this was not going to be the house for her either, but we were going through it, taking a look. I had my phone in my hand, and I remember that I kept receiving call after call, which I would ignore, um, and my phone kept blowing up with text messages. And I remember even making a joke, wow, Friday afternoon and everybody needs to get a hold of me or wants to get a hold of me. But I continued on because I was, you know, in my professional mode and showing the house. And finally, I realized that my manager had called for a second time. And I I went and excused myself and went into the bedroom and, and took the call because we, my manager and I had just closed on a transaction earlier that day that had major issues. The, uh, of course, the paint touch-ups did not match. Um, so I went in there and answered the phone. I honestly was a little annoyed at the, that it was, she was calling a second time thinking we were talking about the paint touch-ups. And I remember when I answered, she asked what I was doing. And I said, showing what else do realtors do on Friday afternoon? And I said, is everything okay? And she said, I need you to call me when you're done. And I again asked if everything was okay. And I remember she paused and she said, your family's fine, but I really need you to call me when, when you leave. And from that, that moment on, I wasn't hanging up the call. And so I finally remember um, her words and she said, I've just been told that Ashley was shot at her open house. She's been taken to the hospital and that's all we know at this point. And that was it. That was the moment when everything changed and life became before that moment and after that moment. I'm going to play this little clip for you from the news um, from that day.
a real estate agent is dead tonight after somebody shot her twice inside the model townhome where she was working. It all happened at 558 Stone Creek Village in West Des Moines. For reference, that's just north of Valley View Aquatic Center. Laura Nichols is covering this story. She has been from the beginning. She brings us the latest from the newsroom tonight. Laura? Well, police are still searching for answers to who could have done this. All day they've been searching the area and talking to neighbors all to find out who could have shot and killed 27-year-old Ashley Oakland. A West Des Moines townhome development is now a crime scene. Shortly after 2 o'clock, a worker for Rotland Homes, the company that developed the area, heard a commotion inside this model townhome and went to check it out. They heard a commotion, didn't say that they heard a gunshot, just a commotion, uh, and uh, went over and found the subject on the floor. Inside, she found 27-year-old real estate agent Ashley Oakland. She was shot twice, once in the head and once in the chest. When we arrived, uh, found a, a subject on the floor, uh, appeared to have had uh, two gunshot wounds. Oakland was taken to Methodist Medical Center in downtown Des Moines, but the Polk County Medical Examiner says she most likely died even before making it to the hospital. As for who could have done this. Right now, investigators are canvassing the area and talk. A real estate agent is dead tonight after somebody shot her twice inside the model. Sorry, guys. Let me try to get back. You stop sharing your screen. There you go. There you Did go. that work? Um, nope. We well, yeah, that's the slide. Perfect. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so that's it. Um, uh, that really sums up what happened that day. Um, it is hard for me to listen to. It's hard for me to hear them talk about. Um, Ashley, who was such a ray of life as the subject, but that was it. That's what we knew. Um, and that's what happened. Unfortunately, this year in April, it will be 13 years. And that's still about all we know. There are still no answers. We do not know who did this. We do not know why this was done to Ashley. Um, what we do know, unfortunately, is that Ashley was hosting an open house. She was doing her job, the job that most all of us that are listening to this today do. We don't know if it was real estate related, but what we do know is that her sitting in an open house, her performing her job, gave the opportunity and gave the time for someone to come in and shoot and kill her. I can tell you before that day, I had been practicing real estate for a long time. I had never given real estate um, safety a second thought. I grew up small town, Iowa. Um, I did not uh, I did not think about where to park my car. I did not think about when we would receive an internet lead, it used to come up and it would pop up and you would have a certain amount of time to accept it. And all I would know is I was meeting Joe Smith and I would meet at a house and I walked into vacant homes meeting strangers often without thinking through any of that. Um, I'm gonna quickly share about Beverly Carter. Uh, Beverly was a real estate agent in Arkansas. Um, Beverly had been an agent for a long time. She had a couple that she began interacting with on the phone, on text, on email. Um, it was a couple that had told her they were moving from California. They would be paying cash. They provided her all of the information that she needed. They, their phone numbers worked. Um, it was a husband and wife. They asked her to show this house at 6 p.m. one evening. It was a vacant home that was out on a lake. You can kind of see not a ton of houses around that. Beverly did a lot of things right. She quickly made up a story that she could not show a vacant home in an evening by herself to a gentleman. Uh, the guy said he was quick on his feet. He said, my wife is going to be joining me from work. So it'll be the two of us. Does that work? And Beverly went ahead and, and scheduled the appointment. When she went to show, uh, she showed up. The husband said, I'm sorry, but my wife got stuck at work. She's on the phone. She was wondering if you, Beverly, could take pictures as we're going through the house so she can be, it'll be like she's there. Immediately, um, Beverly said, absolutely. They went through the house. Beverly's taking 
pictures with her phone that she's going to send to the wife when they're done. Uh, when they got up into that bedroom and Beverly went in first to take a picture and open the closet door, uh, the gentleman said, Beverly, you're about to have a very bad day and pulled out a taser. You see, it was all a setup and he was going to kidnap Beverly to then take money from her from her credit cards. Um, he he kidnapped her. He taped her up in that room. He backed his car up to the part, uh, backed his car up. He put her in the trunk. They took her to their house. The wife was at the house. Unfortunately, he forgot her purse at the house um, and the plan from there went terribly wrong. She was held there at um, in their home for five days until they then took her out to this field, duct taped her mouth and left her there. Again, same job that we do, the same thing that happened uh, to Beverly. When the bad guy was asked why he chose Beverly, what he said was she was a rich broker who worked alone. One amusing part with Beverly, she was not a rich broker, but that's how we're perceived, right? We're perceived that we make thousands of dollars every time that we close a transaction. Um, again, her working alone, those things gave the opportunity for this, this, um, this couple to unfortunately take, take advantage of her. We hear everything happens for a reason, right? I used to believe that I could I could get behind it. I don't any longer believe everything happens for a reason. I came across uh, this quote from Rachel Hollis a few years ago and it really struck me. She said, I used to naively say everything happens for a reason, but that was only because I had not yet lived through something horrific enough to shake that statement to its core. I no longer believe everything happens for a reason. I do now believe it's per it is possible to find purpose even in the absence of explanation or understanding. And that's why I'm here today. That's why I share this story. Um, you could probably hear that my throat, it still catches. Um, it's hard. It is hard to talk about this and what happened to Ashley and know that we still don't have answers. It's hard to share. I've become super close friends with, with Beverly's son, Carl, who started a nonprofit um, sharing realtor safety. These are hard things to talk about, but they're they're important. If we can share Ashley's story and have the conversation about story, if we can talk to you about Beverly Carter and it pauses, it makes us think through what we need to do, how we need to change our practice and what we need to do on a daily basis. If it saves one person, that is why we share this. So through this, I've tried to find a purpose in um, in sharing with others things that we can do. I throw this in there. Usually I, I talk for a lot longer, so I have a lot more um, slides, but I do throw this in there because male agents aren't as worried about safety as women. Here's why they're wrong. This was a quote, and I have a, a thing from um, Tracy Hopkins. She's co coined herself as the safety lady. Um, male agents are targeted. They are. They are also abducted. Uh, they are also killed. They have also been harmed in the line of, of our profession. So please, please know this is for everyone. We all need to pay attention to this. Um, so what now? I am not here to scare you. I do not want any of you to be afraid to do your job. But what I want you to do, what I implore you is please be prepared. Don't be scared. Be prepared. Put things in place. Have these conversations. Hold your, your counterparts um, accountable. I know that my team of agents, you know, if we're together and something happens um, that I'm running to a showing, they said, you, you, you identified them, right? Um, I have many different tips I could go into, but I'm going to talk just a couple of quick things that I want to share with you. The Realtor Safety Pledge, one thing in Iowa that we put in place years ago after Ashley, um, when we we're kind of looking for a purpose, what can we do to change this? What can we do to um, not allow her death to be in vain? And we created a Realtor Safety Pledge. I am proud to say that the National Association of Realtors has really taken up the, um, the initiative of realtor safety in the last several years. Last year, I serve on the, the National Association of Realtor Safety Committee, and we reworked the safety pledge from Iowa. We re reworked it, and NAR has 
adopted this. I encourage all of you to go out and take this safety pledge and live it. But what it says, as a realtor, my first priority is the well-being of, uh, and safety of myself, my colleagues, the clients and customer we serve, and the business partners who foster our profession. Therefore, I pledge to always conduct business and prospecting activities in a reasonably safe manner, which includes following the recommendations from the National Association of Realtors and adhering to the safe listing form to the best of my ability. I am committed to receive education and in turn to advise consumers and colleagues on best safety practices. Realtors are committed to safety and I take this pledge because I care about the well-being of myself, my clients and customers, my colleagues in my profession. And I think a couple of key things there, clients and customers, this isn't just for us as realtors, and that would be enough for us to take our own well-being, but this is for our clients and our customers. When we think about when we list a house, we are inviting strangers into the home of our clients, uh, into the home of our sellers, where they, where they, uh, their children sleep. So it's so important for us. This is our profession. It is, it is our duty to advise consumers and colleagues on those best safety practices. I know we're getting close on time, but I want to highlight this listing safety forms. I use this in every single one of my listing packets. Uh, Again, this was something that we had designed in Iowa that NAR um, improved on in, in Champion. You can find it out on the NAR safety website, which I'll highlight at the end here. But what this is saying, it gives you a really great tool to just go through and say, during your listing period, please consider some following recommendations. Lock up your valuables, personal information, medications, weapons, on showings, do not open your door to any strangers. And at the end, it gives sellers an option that they can request that their property only be shown to prospective buyers who have been pre-qualified or properly identified. And this makes it really easy to have that conversation with your sellers. It also makes it easy on the buyer side because when somebody calls me and wants to see one of my listings on a sign call, I now have the tool to say, absolutely, I would love to give you more information and get you in this home. The seller has requested that the home only be shown to identified buyers. I either need to meet you in a public place, I need a copy of your government issued ID, whatever practices you put in place, but it does give you some teeth to actually have those conversations with. I'm going to skip through a lot of this. Again, I know we are tight on time today. I have tons of tips that I can share with you a different time. But a couple things I want to highlight, and these sound silly. They seem like things that we know, but they are the most important. Trust your gut. We all have that feeling. Um, I'm not good with feelings or emotions. I hate them. I stuff them down. I don't want to have time for them, but we have to be aware of our gut. You have those that sixth sense if that something feels wrong. If it doesn't feel right, pause, think through what you want to do. It's okay to say no. It's okay to not meet someone. It's okay if you're in an open house and somebody wants you to come upstairs into the bedroom. It's okay to say, it is not my practice to leave this room. This is where I stand during my open house. It's okay when a gentleman says, ladies first. It's okay for me to say, I'm sorry, the way I practice my real estate, I am demonstrating the house, clients first. It's okay to go through that, but practice what you're going to say so that things like that roll off the tip of your tongue. Another one is if you see something, say something. I think this is hard. I think we are we live in a world where everything is busy. We are constantly going. I know I have a million things in my mind. Honestly, sometimes we just don't want to get involved. But if you see something, say something. I could tell you many, many, many more details about Beverly Carter and how what happened when she went to show that house. I could tell you that the gentleman pulled up in a black car right next to her. I can tell you that she went in the house, he followed her. I can tell you that later a gentleman came out of the house, he pulled his black car up and he backed it in, opened the trunk. The reason we know all those details is because at the trial, the neighbor who watched all of that testified. He saw something. He did not see Beverly get put in the trunk, but he saw something that felt off. He, if he would have said something, who knows what could have happened. So 
please, please, if you see something, say something. And the biggest thing that you can do is keep the conversation going. Make sure that you're having conversations with your colleagues about what practices do you have in place? How do you host your open house to be safe? How do you show houses? Where do you park your car? Again, sadly, I had never had any of these conversations years into real estate. I think I was six years in before Ashley happened and I gave a second thought to real estate. So make sure that you're holding these, um, having these conversations, holding yourselves accountable. And the reason I want that is um, Beverly Carter, we're dedicated to the ideal of every agent goes home safe every day. That's our tagline. That's what we live for. Um, Beverly had her phone um, a couple of times to record messages to her her family. Um, it was supposed to be part of, of the bad guy's plan. However, on one message, what she said while she was being held, um, kidnapped for a week, the thing that she made sure to tell her family was, I just want you to know, I love you very much. You all have those people in your life. You have the people that it is so important for you to come home every single day. So please, please put your safety while you're practicing this awesome industry that we all get to be in. Couple of places I wanna direct you to, the Beverly Carter Foundation. If you go out there, tons of resources, beverlycarterfoundation.org. Follow them on social media, Instagram, um, Facebook. They do a great job with just little tips. Keep safety, safety in the forefront of your mind. And also, like I said, National Association of Realtors, I am so proud of all the work that they have done and really championing realtor safety. Go out to nar.realtor backslash safety. They have some really great videos out there, um, safety pledges out there, the listing safety form, other forms, intake forms that you can use. Their videos are top notch. They are great if you're looking something to show your team members um, in those things. And I know that I am going a little long, so I will kind of wrap up. But thank you all so much for having me today and for taking a few minutes to listen about safety. Jen, thank you so much. Now there, we do have some questions. If okay, we, perfect. Um, Jimmy, who is out, he's our managing director out in Grand Junction. Do you have a place in your brokerage if an agent feels like they're going to get in trouble? Um, do you have something in place? Like they have the red file call and what do you recommend? Uh, what apps do you recommend to, to vet prospective clients? So there's two so questions. Oh, sorry. I am a huge proponent of Forewarn. I love Forewarn. Um, met it through, or met the Forewarn gentleman through the Beverly Carter Foundation. Actually, was able to negotiate a deal to get all of DMAR um, provided with Forewarn, all of Des Moines Area Association of Realtors. So I am a huge, huge, huge proponent of Forewarn. I put every single person through Forewarn. It does not matter if you are a referral from my mom from her church, you are getting put through forewarn. So I have that PDF that goes in there. Um, yes, make sure that you have something in place, have a safety plan. So our, uh, our team, we have an emoji that we use. If they're, if we are showing and something, um, you know, it seems faster to be able to hit a, an emoji that we send. Make sure that you have something and make sure other people know that and trust them. Make sure it's someone that answers. But the biggest thing I want to say is if you truly find yourself in a scenario that you, you don't feel good about, don't take time to reach out to call the red folder. Make sure that you realize it is okay to call 911. If you are truly in a scenario, uh, you know, a lot of the things I do, uh, sadly, would be directing at finding my body. Right. We all if you are truly in one of those scenarios, you have a split second to make a decision. I would rather apologize that I overreacted than my my I not go home to my family that night. Um, the other one is technology. And I think, Jen, we'll we'll probably get into this next week. Hey, everyone. Um, next week, we're going to focus on realtor safety again. Um, and we're going to make a, di a discussion. So come and listen. Um, let's talk about what we're doing. And I am encouraging all of the managing directors, 
in the next week's meetings, or if you have a round table after this, let's make realtor safety a discussion. Let's talk about what we do, what we don't do. Maybe even talk about times where, I, because Jen, as you shared stories, I was like, oh, geez, I remember doing that once and that was not cool and I should never do it again. Even um, now, I mean, I still, I find myself and I'm like, what am I doing? So it, that's okay. But having the, that awareness and those discussions. Awesome. Jen, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us. We appreciate it. Uh, have a good weekend and everyone else. I'll see you next week.